Mr. Barsky, thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, uh, you're most welcome. <laughs> Your book is entitled Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB spy in America. Mm -hmm. Let's That's correct. kind of cover at the outset. If you could give me a brief timeline of your career as a KGB spy in America, as your book notes, and then I want to dive into some of the details. Go ahead. Uh, born in 1949, four years after the end of World War II, in a uh, very remote uh, uh, section, rural section of East Germany, was occupied by the by the Soviet Army. Uh, that that part of uh, Germany became the German Democratic Republic, a, a communist vassal state of the Soviet Union. And uh, so I grew up uh, under communism, uh, was brainwashed like you wouldn't believe. Uh, we weren't aware of it. We were just told one truth and the only truth there, there was, it's like, it was like a cult. Uh, we were even taught uh, in college, one course was, was called scientific Marxism, Leninism. That's a, that's bizarre, you know. <laughs> there was no science, but we believed it. And uh, you know what? What got me out of that uh, that poor section of Germany was uh, education. You know, I I did very well in school. I aced high school, and then I then I aced college. I got a, a national scholarship that was that was elite. I mean, it was it was limited to one hundred concurrent holders in the country. And somehow it must have uh, gotten on the radar of the KGB because one day, uh, I don't want to get too much into detail, one, one day somebody showed up in my dorm room and, uh, and started talking and eventually, one, you know, it was all small talk and a bunch of BS and I was wondering, what, 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 what do you want? But I didn't ask and eventually he, he came up with what, what he said he wanted and, and he said, well, when, you, when you're done with the, your, that was in my junior year in college, when you when you when you have your degree, uh, could you imagine yourself work for the government one day? And I said, and I gave him the answer that he was looking for. Sure, but not as a chemist because I studied chemistry. And so he had the answer, and he uh, we we had a meeting the following week uh, at a restaurant. He invited me, and there was another fellow there, and he introduced me to this man. And he said, "Oh, by the way, this is." Uh, Herman, we are working with our Soviet comrades. Well, and then he left. And so here I landed in, uh, you know, having uh, lunch or and the German big meal and at mid midday with Herman, a KGB agent, because I knew immediately he did not say that. I knew he was KGB. And uh, they took 18 months to study me. And it wasn't like the, 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 the CIA does it. It, uh, it wasn't like, you know, passing tests and, and talking to psychologists and you know, lie detector tests, none of that. It was one-on-one -on -one with Herman, nothing more. And, and the, we, he was a good guy. I liked him. We, I, we met once, you know, every other week. And we talked about everything, about life. Uh, and uh, I established a reputation that I was like really, really honest because I told him about things that I thought were my weaknesses, blah, blah, blah. In hindsight, I now know that every time we met, he, uh, uh, he, he wrote a report. He also introduced me to the idea of becoming an illegal in West Germany uh, and, uh, and you know what it would be like, so forth. Uh, and some, he gave me some minor tasks to determine whether I would be able to uh, overcome hesitation to uh, talk to strangers, that kind of thing, or, or find out, here's a building, find out who, who works there. There was no, you know, that kind of stuff, minor. And then one day he, uh, he told me uh, to, I was gonna, he was gonna send me to Berlin for three weeks for some, some light training. I was not prepared at the end of that light training. I was going to be taken to the headquarters of the Soviet Army in Berlin, and that also was the headquarters of the uh, of the KGB. And I am pretty sure I was led to the the uh, office of the 
East German head of the KGB, when the, nobody ever introduced themselves, who, who they were, no range, no, 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 no uh, a great serial number, n name, everything was like code names, right? And so he did a little, little small talk, and eventually he came right out. And he says, "Oh, so uh, are you are you going to be in or not?" And I was like, "What?" I I didn't say what, you know. I'm inside. I wasn't prepared for that question, and I stalled him, and I said, "Well, I I can't make a decision. I don't know if I qualify, and uh, and I'm not at all trained." And he said, "Don't worry. We know that you qualify, and we will train you." Now, the one thing though. Uh, we need we need to find out. We only uh, work with people who make decisions quickly, because that's a prerequisite in our uh, in, in in our profession. I gave you a tomorrow until tomorrow noon. That was a, a sleepless night, uh, <laughs> and again I went back and forth because I I had a really really good career ahead of me in, at the college where where I studied, and and I my my. I, I, my passion was basketball. I was uh, in the starting lineup of the college basketball team, and I had to pretty much, I had to face the idea that I had to get rid of my entire past and become somebody else and start brand new in a different country, even though it was supposed to be German. So anyway, eventually, um, they, when they studied me, Herman had that I would uh, answer yes, because my sense of adventure, my my knowledge that I was going to be something really special, you know, pride, and you know, look at the, the KGB, they want me, then I got to be really good, uh, and uh, you know, the ability to travel to the West and have my cake and eat it too. That is, you know, do great things for the revolution and and help and help establish communism in the world, but also uh, benefit from what I knew was a higher standard of living in the West. So I said yes, and so two years of training in Berlin turned out that uh, 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 I had a talent uh, to acquire English to a point where I didn't speak it with a heavy German accent. So somebody from Moscow Center, when they came visit, the, head, the light went up in his head, and uh, he he had me go to Moscow where talk with a born American and, and, and a, a college teacher who, who Russian, who, who taught uh, English. And uh, we spoke for about a half hour and then they went back and went back and forth. And, and eventually the, the American said, I can teach him. I can teach him to a point where he can uh, pretend to have been born in the United States. He has that kind of talent. All right, so I wound up in Moscow, got two and a half more years of training in Moscow, mostly uh, English, uh, but but uh, also very, very in-depth training of uh, counter surveillance and that kind of stuff that where they had more specialists in Moscow than in Berlin. And uh, in uh, 1978, in the fall, I got on a plane and uh, through a zigzag route, uh, you know, through several countries, three different uh, false passport, I eventually wound up in Chicago, O'Hare. And from there, after a couple a week, I got on a plane, and wound up in New York, and uh, started uh, my operational uh, activities, which initially required me to get uh, bona fide U.S. documentation. What I had on me was a was a uh, valid birth certificate that uh, the KGB stole. We, we stole the identity of a Jack Barsky who was born in the US uh, in 1944 and passed away 11 years later. In those days, it was easy to get anybody's birth certificate. It was a big, big old hole in the security. The same way now that cyber is a big hole in security in our country. We, we're we still open to enemies, att enemy attacks, way wide open. So uh, yeah, and so based on that birth certificate, uh, you know, I was able to acquire a driver's license uh, from the DMV in New York, and then uh, also get a social security number. In those days, uh, it wasn't highly unusual uh, to get a social security number as an adult because there were two uh, segments of the population that were not covered by social security law. Uh, and that was uh, employees of religious institutions, 
and farm workers. And I told him that I was a farm worker. So bingo, uh, took about a year for me to uh, apply for my first job. And uh, it was a bit of a interesting career change. You know, I was already, when I left uh, the university, I was already an assistant professor. My first job in the US was bike mess mirror in Manhattan. <laughs> But it paid enough for me to rent an apartment and not have to get uh, you know money from the KGB to just live. And uh, so I'm going to stop right here. Uh, from that point on, I spent uh, altogether ten years in the U.S. until uh, I broke up with the KGB. So but culturally, what was the adjustment like when you got to the United States? Um, well. I had a practice trip to Canada. I spent uh, th uh, three months in, in Canada. So um, the culture shock was already taken care of. I knew, I mean, it was like um, I spent uh, um, two months in Montreal as a tourist, and I was just blown away by how many different things you can buy. I mean, I went to the, 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 depart the bank department store and I just wandered around like it, like you would go to a museum. And I was so amazed that they had, you know, you could uh, choose from a selection of maybe a dozen or so carpets, high quality carpets. When in East Germany, you, uh, you were lucky to find one. <laughs> and the food was better and all this. So, so that was taken care of. Uh, uh, New York, uh, obviously is a big city and uh, i spent the first year when i couldn't go to work i i left the hotel that i was was staying in and uh, you know and where i paid up by the month i left it in the morning to pretend that like I, I had some place to go and then i just explored the city subway on foot you know it was just like i'm a curious kind of guy but also it was important to you know because the city became my playground. You need to know uh, operationally, you need to know w what you can do in that city and, and which, which places would be the proper places to check whether you're being surveilled or where you, where you can put in a, a letter in, in, the, in the mailbox that, it, that eventually winds up in Moscow and so forth. So um, I uh, slowly, uh, you know, adjusted and and then when I was a bike messenger, I did that for altogether four years. I became a street urchin, you know. <laughs> you got you got to have elbows as a as a cyclist in in those days anyway, because now they have bike lanes. They didn't have any, so I had to fight with the cars and uh, and uh, and mostly pedestrians because they didn't give a damn about bike lanes. <laughs> yeah, it uh, you know it, I I really didn't feel bad about this. You know, I did the job because, you know, I, I wanted to be the best bike messenger the same way I wanted to be a best, the best spy, but, it, but you know, it wasn't time to do spying yet. And, and uh, so I got to get uh, into plan A um, because plan A is really important. This is one thing that was where the KGB was actually brilliant in many other respects. They didn't know what the heck they were doing. Uh, I found that out the hard way, and, and much of the advice I, they gave me was uh, was inappropriate and was based on ignorance. But but this was a good plan. I uh, you know once I had the uh, the documentation and worked for a year, I was supposed to apply for a passport, and and uh, and then travel to say uh, Switzerland, and and you know open up a company, whatever. We didn't talk about the specifics, but a company, whatever uh, small company, where the K KGB would be able to uh, funnel a lot of cash into that company. And within two years, I would come back to the United States, upper, upper middle class with whatever, maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars, a lot of money in those days. And I could join a country club and meet some people that would be of interest uh, for recruitment. And I was also supposedly uh, gather intelligence with regard to foreign policy. So maybe you know get get in touch with foreign policy makers and so forth. Brilliant plan failed because <clears throat> I made a mistake filling out the application. 
and uh, the the clerk who was looking at it, there was a red flag. I can't can't get into detail. It would take too much time. I'm going to talk all day, unfortunately. And people can read my book or, or uh, you know, look at my my website. And, and there's also a uh, um, uh, a uh, audio drama out there that that's really well made. It's called The Agent, uh, free of charge. Twelve. Uh, it, it's also about my life. So you know you can find out more about this stuff, the details. So uh, and uh, and uh, you know he said he called me back to to the counter and said we have some we have some uh, doubt about your identity and that was a moment of danger. Mm, he made me fill out an auxiliary questionnaire and the first question was where did you go to high school? I busted because there was no record of Jack Barsky ever being uh, being in high school. So I managed to run back to the counter and and grab my application and my 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 documents that was lying in front of the guy, and and I stormed out, fully aware that I might be arrested right then and there, or maybe arrested in a couple of days later. Never happened. That was the first stroke of luck. All right. So then we decided Plan B. Uh, I uh, I went to college. Uh, they told me to study economics, which I uh, unilaterally changed when when I fell in love with information technology, and they were okay with that, you know. And so I I, I entered City University Baruch College and uh, raced through the program in three years, uh, and I aced it. That was another mistake, because now I had to uh, give the the graduation speech speech in uh, felt forum in front of 4,000 people. And I think about it, that was so damn stupid. I didn't, this was, a, uh, it was cultural ignorance. I didn't know that when, when you uh, graduate number one, uh, you, you were the valedictorian. And when that word was uh, shared with me by the, by the dean, I, you know, I, I know how to hide big surprises, but internally I went like, oh, sh <laughs> and uh, and then he said, "Well, what, what do you what, what what do you think you want to talk about in, uh, in the, during the graduation speech?" And I didn't want to do this. I knew, knew that it was risky. He somehow talked me into it, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to do it." You know, think about it. There's four thousand people in the uh, in the audience. The valedictorian is r r roughly ten years older than the other graduates, and he speaks with a slight but noticeable accent. It, it was another stroke of luck that nobody, after we were done, was hanging out with some professors and we're talking uh, outside and nobody, but not a single person came up and say, hey, that is amazing. How did you do it? Where did you come from? Nothing like that. You know, so I, you know, I was pretty good, but I was also lucky. You know, folks like me get most of the information about what you did from books and movies and other things procedurally. How did it work in terms of how were you given assignments? How did you report back to superiors? Things of that nature. Yeah, the communication, unlike what uh, people uh, quote unquote know when they watch the Americans, there was never a one on one meeting. My, my handler was not allowed. If there was a handler, there was somebody. Uh, who communicated with me in New York through signals only, okay? That was the only communication, graphic signals, either way. And just very, very basic stuff, like I arrived in the country or I received your recent uh, radiogram and stuff like that. Uh, so, um, and the communication was, uh, <laughs> it was a bitch, I'm sorry to say that. It was very awkward. I got my, once a week, I uh, turned on uh, my shortwave radio, dialed the frequency that was always at the same time for 10 years. At, uh, um, um, let me see, that it, it was at 8.15 on a Thursday, and, uh, and, and I listened to uh, Morse code, yeah, nothing but digits, did, 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 and uh, I wrote it down. And then I had to decrypt this. Uh, you know, I had an algorithm that uh, where you do some little, you know, little math on on the, the digits that were sent, and then you get another set set of uh, digits that then translated into letters, and and then you got your message. 
Now, the, the entire process could could take at minimum an hour and a half and sometimes up to four hours. So into the middle of the night, uh, you know, and, and still the, the amount of information that uh, that you could transmit that way was limited. It was even more limited for me to send uh, reports back. That that was done through uh, letters in secret writing. I had uh, at the beginning, I had two what we call convenience addresses addresses in the West. One was uh, uh, in South America. The other was, I think, in Austria. And uh, I, I was allowed to write one letter a month to each one of the addresses. And each letter was limited to only two pages where I could put uh, a secret writing on it. So I would write an open text pretending that I know the person, make, making up all kinds of nonsense. And then uh, I, I, would, uh, I had a contact paper that uh, was used to put in with invisible text that that secret writing uh, on on top of the open text, and then when it then it I would now I would have to go on a surveillance detection route to make sure that nobody saw me put a, an envelope in a mailbox, and that took three hours. So typically, one letter took away at least half of my Saturday, if not more. And then this letter would go to uh, per email to the addressee who then got in touch with his handler in that particular country, handed him the, uh, the letter, which went into a diplomatic pouch. Then it wound up in Moscow. Uh, it would be, uh, the text would, uh, the, uh, the, the paper would be developed. I once saw an, an example of what what the developed text looked like. It was readable, but pretty 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 rough. So you can imagine that the communication cycle was uh, it, it was asynchronous, you know. And you know, I, it, I that required me to make all important decisions that had to be made within a week or even a month myself. Couldn't ask anybody. And thank God, because if I, if I asked them, they would have given me like information based on ignorance, because what they thought they knew, they didn't know. The, uh, the, the folks that were ignorant, and this, this, the worst part of ignorance is when you don't know what you don't know. And they thought they knew, because they had spent time in the uh, United States under diplomatic cover. And so they had interacted with Americans, they, uh, they knew how to, you know, go to a restaurant and order a meal and all this stuff, but they didn't know what it meant to be an American. They didn't know it. The first thing, they never had to apply for a job, right? They actually didn't go to hotels because they had like, uh, in, 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 in the north of Manhattan, it's, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, but you, you, you remember, when you go in the northern part of, uh, of Manhattan, there, there was a, uh, a, a Soviet, uh, uh, um, uh, facility where, where they all lived. And then they commuted to the UN or wh wh wherever the, the, uh, the embassy. No, the, the embassy was in DC. They, they commuted to the UN fundamentally. So anyway, uh, uh, bottom line is um, communication was really awkward. Occasionally when I had some, some a lot more information that I wanted to uh, transmit and that happened only about three, four times I would write it down, take pictures of the uh, of the the writing, and put the undeveloped cartridge into a container that I made out of uh, plaster of Paris, to make it look like a stone, and dumped it someplace in a park, and in what we call a dead drop operation, and and one of those diplomats picked it up. But that was a rarity because these dead drop operations were dangerous, even though they weren't meetings, but nevertheless. If, if the diplomat was followed and there was a good chance that they might be, that could lead them back to me. So my, you know, contact was to be avoided uh, uh, or was to be held to a minimum, even asynchronous contact. And in third countries, that was not a problem. I always met people in other countries on my way. You know, I traveled back and forth uh, between uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. Uh, five times. 
uh, every every two years. And I always went to a third country where I would meet somebody to give me a, a passport that I could use to uh, fly into into Moscow. It was, I mean, everything was just uh, uh, the, the KGB was really good keeping things as secure as possible, uh, particular particularly for a high risk operation like mine. Now, you were ultimately compromised in December of 88, uh, and you decided to stay in America. What well, was I wasn't process? compromised. You thought I was. Tell me about that. Well, so we had uh, we had a, a, an emergency protocol in case uh, I had to run, and that would be a signal that I said uh, someplace, and so they would know I'm on the run, or they thought I was in danger. Well, one day... I got the get danger signal. And it's another moment where I said, oh, sh give me a shoot. <laughs> I used a stronger word. Um, it was on my way to work. Uh, they knew this was, this was prearranged. They knew my way to work. And there was a spot where I had to look for that particular signal, for any signal. But that day, there was it was a red dot <clears throat> on the support beam, beam for the elevated part of the uh, the A train that went into Manhattan out of Queens. <clears throat> and said, though I see, see that red dot, hey, uh, I was supposed to run right away. Don't, the, the protocol said, don't go home. Don't, don't just go and pick up the emergency documents that you, that I had uh, buried uh, someplace in a park in, in the Bronx <clears throat> and, and make your way to Canada. And, uh, well, you know, say hello at the Soviet embassy and then we'll take you home. I wasn't ready. What they didn't know, the same way they didn't know that I gave the graduation speech, because I already knew that they did not check on me. Because if, if they had, uh, if they had got gotten knowledge that I, I was a public figure for a while, they would have read me the riot act, and that that was a no no. So, so the other thing I knew that they didn't know that I had an eighteen month old child in, uh, in. Uh, the U.S., a little girl by the name of Chelsea, who uh, I watched growing up. The mother lived with me. Too much detail here. But, uh, beautiful child. I mean, just stunningly beautiful. And uh, this was the first time in my life that I actually I felt the pull of unconditional love. And it's very, very strong. Well, I found out that it's very strong. So at that point, I wasn't prepared. I sort of knew that I would leave them one day, but I, the, the mother and the child, but I tried to figure out how to like remotely support them because mom had only four years of schooling. So without my support, this child would grow up in poverty for sure. So I just went straight to work and uh, sat down in front of my screen, computer screen, and fundamentally did nothing because I couldn't. I had to think about what what next, what next, what next, and I no, I had no idea. So I decided to. I was supposed to um, acknowledge that that I'm leaving. I had to. I was supposed to set another sign, and I, and I didn't. So well, I knew I could stall because one, there was a two week period when I could not uh, do anything because I I I had to injured my soldier my shoulder. And uh, and for two two weeks I I couldn't uh, listen to the radio and I couldn't set signs I couldn't do anything, and they they knew about it so there was a chance that like maybe the radio was broken or I was in a hospital or whatever, so I stalled for about three weeks, and then they broke the rules and the rules were as I said not to get in not to physically be in the same space as as the illegal, well, one day somebody showed up because they needed to know what's going on with with uh, uh, Dita. That was my cover name, uh, and uh, so it was early in the morning. I was waiting for the subway, and there's this short guy come up to me, and uh, uh, he he whispered in my ears, "You gotta come home, or else you're dead." Never forget the sentence in my life, and it was spoken with a heavy accent, which gave me uh, some hope that you're dead 
was not really a threat. It was just a uh, bad use of the word dead rather than, you know, you're busted or they're going to get you or something like that. But you have to take it seriously. So now now I, I have to, now they knew that I know, that they know. So a decision was forthcoming. It, uh, that night they uh, gave in a radiogram, uh, invited me for a dead drop operation where I would get money and, and a passport. So I went. Uh, without having made the decision, but I, at least I was going to collect the money. Right. <laughs> so, and, uh, unfortunately that was the only dead drop of operation that failed because when I went to the spot and it was easy to find, I, I know exactly where I was going. <clears throat> and the, the, the sign, the signal was set. The guy who supposedly put that oil can, this was the container that they were using across the oil can in, into that spot. I put a signal that says, go pick up the oil can, and I couldn't find it. And I couldn't find it, and I was like wandering around and say, maybe you put it like someplace nearby, nothing. And as I'm, it was in a park in, on Staten Island, and as I'm walking out of there, it was a decision that was not arrived at through logical thinking. It was my subconscious saying, I'm staying. It was... It was amazing because the when I looked at the the pros and cons, all the pros were for me to go. Even even if I'm brave enough to stay, if I get if the Russians were right, and I got arrested, I'm no no use to the child and her mother either. So I could have easily rationalized. I ought to go. I'm sorry, and I would have you know cried some tears, and then put it away. And I couldn't. And that is the power of unconditional love. So, you know, for like three months, I made sure that I'm not being, uh, I'm not being investigated by the, the FBI and that the KGB is not uh, on, on my case. I sent the KGB in a, uh, a letter to explain to them I am not defecting. That was not my plan anyway. I am. I am not. I, I. I will not betray the cause. But I can't come home because I have HIV/AIDS. That was brilliant. Everybody who knows who who who, who hears the story, it was absolutely brilliant because, based on my track record they, and based on what they knew about my existence, they had no reason not to believe it. So. I didn't know that they believe it. I found out many, many years afterwards. But they went to my German family, and I asked them to to uh, hand my German family the dollar savings that had accumulated, and they gave him some money. It, it it appears it was maybe half. Probably the guy who who had the money probably took half of it for himself. <laughs> you, you know, in, in in the espionage world, even today, half is king. Can't be tracked, right? So after three months, I wasn't a clear. I said to uh, my wife, "All right, you know, I know you wanted uh, to, you you always wanted the house. Let's go save some money." And within a year, I wound up in in Orange County. Uh, in now I forget the name of the, the little village. Uh, uh, it'll come to me later. It doesn't matter. Orange County on the on the other side of the Hudson, in a nice little house. And uh, started uh, working on my version of the American dream, which primarily was uh, rather obvious consumerism, but mostly to make a good life for the two girls that were in my life, and then the son that was born. It wasn't much about me, but you know, it was always I. I went through a number of houses, bigger, better, and bigger cars, better cars, and good stuff. And and my communist ideology had disappeared because um, in nineteen uh, in nineteen eighty nine the wall came down, and boy oh boy was I surprised, but I wasn't the only one. The CIA was surprised and the KGB was surprised too. So uh, that now I'm curious. I said, what happened? I, I I never thought that would happen ever, 
And so I had access to the internet and I did some research and oh boy, oh boy, did I find it, find out, you know, I, at least I had an open mind, find out how wrong my, my, my upbringing was with regard to what I learned to believe. And, and it was, was fundamentally upside down. So I just dumped communism altogether, but I didn't go any further. I just said, I wanted to just be a private citizen and live out my life and, and serve the family and, and, and do well. Well, that, that changed, uh, that changed uh, in uh, 2013 when, when the World Trade Center came down. That's when I, you know, became an emotionally an American. Uh, and one other thing happened that was uh, key to my development and to my ability to speak to you today was that it was a betrayal because, you know, the FBI couldn't have found me, period. I mean, I was, I was like gone. I had stopped doing any kind of activity and I was legal. You know, I had a number of jobs and, and you know, I always had no problem getting, getting the job with my, the documentation I had. Uh, so, but there was this fellow uh, who uh, was in charge of the archives, KGB archives for directorate, for the first directorate espionage. And he had surprisingly access to all the documents, you know, which probably was moving the room around and blah. And so he could read what was in there and he would, he hated, he had grown to hate the Soviet state. Uh, partially because of what he found in, in those in those files. And so the only way he figured to to do damage is like take notes, hand handwritten on small pieces of paper and, and smuggle them out in his socks and his underwear and and then take the notes in his in his dacha and, and transcribe them in a typewriter and put the pages <clears throat> and buried them. Eventually when he showed up with that with that stash, uh he didn't show up with that stash when when the MI6 he, he approached MI6 in a Baltic state and and they managed to dig up uh, I think it was three cases worth of documentation the greatest find in the history of espionage and uh, he managed to uh, leave be, be, to leave Russia at the time it was already Russia it was 1992 and uh, lived. <laughs> Uh, he lived out his life in London, and amongst the pile of information, there were a few sentences that says there's a guy named Jack Barsky. He lives in the Northeast. He's an illegal. I then eventually got to the FBI, and they took literally two years to just watch me. And the reason that they were so cautious, they knew instinctively that I was one of the best trained agents that they ever faced. So if they got too close and I was still active, I'd be on the run. So they were just from a distance were watching me to try to figure out, is he still active? Because there was a little bit of paranoia in the intelligence community because there was a time when, when there was a mole in the CIA and there was a mole in, in the FBI and they were not known at the time, uh, Robert Hansen and Aldrich Ames. And God forbid if I was running them, well, after two two years of uh, watching me from a distance and uh, even trying to get a little closer by buying the house next door, um, parallels with what happened to the Americans who had an FBI agent uh, live next door. <laughs> so uh, they eventually decided it was time to to introduce themselves, which they did on a Friday. Uh, on I was crossing the Delaware River, commuting from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. And uh, so I was stopped by a state trooper and asked to step out of the vehicle. I wasn't thinking anything. So what, you know, I was ready to show him my driver's license. And then this guy comes up and, he's, and he said, uh, and I, he, he flipped uh, an ID and I immediately knew what that was. I, I was never a slow thinker. So <laughs> I knew that was, it had to be FBI and said, FBI, we want to talk to you. So they took me to, uh, Took me to a, a motel uh, just south of Stroudsburg, and, uh, and on on the way, 
like I, I was silent for a couple of minutes and then I asked, am I under arrest? And uh, the, there was another agent in the car, but the lead agent said, uh, uh, no, nothing else, no. And then I figured instinctively, I, I knew that it would be easier for me if they liked me a little bit. So I asked them, so what took you so long? And there was a bit of a smile uh, that I saw that, that the guy ne next to me, uh, he smiled a little bit, he couldn't contain himself. Well, um, and we uh, we wound up in a motel room, but they had uh, the motel was L shaped, and they had uh, uh, one wing. They rented all the rooms, and they were fully prepared for for me to not be cooperative. There was a an armed guard at e at e either end, and then we sat down, and uh, we started talking. And I volunteered before they even could ask the first question. I I said I know enough. Uh, to understand that the only way to come away out of this situation with the least amount of damage is uh, that if I cooperate 100% and I'm willing and perfectly able to do so. And so then, you know, we started talking for a while and after an hour and a half, they let me go. Not without warning me. So if you think you can run, we got a whole team covering all the intersections. You, you can't get out. So I went home, went to sleep, and for the next uh, three to four weeks, uh, I had one to two meetings, one on one with a lead agent, who asked me hey, everything, every about every detail of my life, my growing up, you know, my teacher, about everything you, you could possibly ask of a person, uh, and uh, that period. There was no promise. I, I, it, it, it was hanging out there, I believe. I, th I thought I might be able to get out of it without going to jail, but it wasn't promised. I just like blindly just cooperated. And then I had to pass a lie detector test. And after I passed the lie detector test uh, in, in this final one-on-one -on -one meeting, who is now my friend, the lead agent, Joe Riley, said, um, we have... Uh, decided that uh, there is a path to citizenship for you, but it's going to take time. Okay. Yeah, it was a big relief because, you know, I was afraid, but besides, you know, I was always prepared to go to jail, but I was afraid that, uh, you know, my family, so I had two children and a, and a wife, that the, the wife would uh, be expelled from the country because she got her uh, citizenship uh, because I filed for her and that wasn't valid and that the kids then would be become wardens of the state and I was very relieved that things would be okay and it took a while seven years ago eventually I be became a citizen how do you think post-cold war espionage is different um certainly you're not involved anymore but how has things like the internet social media, now they're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. all of these things, um, they must matter in some way. How do you oh, think they matter? Oh, oh, they do for sure. Uh, I mean, technology, you can find out a lot of stuff using technology. Uh, and uh, I think the, the CIA uh, went overboard and, and, and you know, went, went all in uh, for a while, ignoring human intelligence. Now, here's the thing. No matter what, AI, whatever it is, as long as people make decisions, human intelligence is still key. You want to know what's in 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 the head of the state. You want to know what's in, in Putin's head. Now, wouldn't that be great if you could hack that brain? Can't. All right. So human intelligence is still key, and um, it's it's easy to just like throw technology uh, into things. Now, having said that. Um, you know, one way to get access to people that uh, have uh, have knowledge that is uh, that, that you want to find out. You know, we, you talked about uh, um, AI, but I want to point out the the deep fakes on the internet, uh, and they are getting very sophisticated. And the, and the Russians were on the forefront uh, 
I think you you probably have heard of the Internet Research Agency that has been uh, uh, producing these these deep fakes for years already. And one one of the the ways that they, the Russians interfere in the U.S. election was by using those fakes. You know what they do they and and they were they weren't really targeting uh, a victory for for uh, Trump. They were just trying to divide the country and make the division that we have already bigger. And they were quite successful with that. You know, once you uh, uh, w w w once you so doubt in, in in Americans about the validity of the democratic system, the the, the republic that we live in, uh, you you took a big step in into undermining. Uh, the entire country, and we see what's happening, you know. And it's it's not just on the left; it's on the right. It has different flavors, uh, and we need to get back to where we came from. And and you know, this is not a political statement. This is more or less because I I'm not enrolled in any party, and I and I and I, I don't speak on behalf of any party. But but it's a philosophical statement based on. My determination, what I told you about the the way this country is structured still is the only way to avoid some one day some evil dictator coming to power like Hitler did in Germany. Okay, and, and don't don't say it can't happen here. It happened in many different places. Uh, so um, I I digressed here. Oh yeah, the deep fakes and and uh, there is. There is World War Three going on, and that's on the internet. If if anybody thinks we don't have capacity to turn the lights off in, in Moscow, we do. Okay, and but we got to be worried about them having the same ability. So uh, there's a whole and cybersecurity is absolutely key. And and I I you know I'm, every time I talk about this, I get on a soapbox, and I'm remembering Kennedy's speech about going to the moon. We need somebody to inspire us to be more secure on the internet because we are so wide open, all of us, including me. But you know, I'm at least at least aware because I've been in IT. I had a long career in IT. And you know, I, and I have contacts in, you know, retired FBI and, and some active people. Uh, who, so I know really what, I know how to behave. But we give, uh, our, children, iPhones and iPads in, at an early age, and there's no attempt to teach them cyber hygiene unless you do it in the home. Why can't we just have mandatory courses in high school and in college? I know why not, because you're making people uncomfortable because they're, they're making it harder to operate on the internet and that makes you unpopular. So politicians don't have an interest in pursuing this. And uh, big tech that should be doing it would be probably losing customers. So uh, somebody needs to inspire the, the, the folks that can do this to, to, take, to reduce the vulnerability that we have. Mr. Barsky, they say that a good life is a life made of memories. Your life is filled with whole lot of interesting stories. Any regrets? The, uh, yeah, well, uh, the, the, the one regret I have is to, to have uh, uh, deserted my German wife, who I promised that I would be back. Now, uh, it's, you can rationalize it. I did it, I did it, and I did the damage. Uh, but I, I did not, I wasn't unfaithful to her. It was a child that I made me stay in the country. It was not another woman. It was not the child's mother. That's the, the, the only regret. Everything else, I cannot say I regret, uh, you know, I lied and I cheated and I stole and I, I broke a ton, ton of laws, but it was not out of selfish motivation. It was because I followed an ideology that I, uh, that I had bought into. It's like, as I said, it's like a cult and cults can make you do things that that are against your grain if you're allowed to actually discover the truth. Uh, and, you know, memories, 
there's some good memories. Uh, you know, you know, they, they were primar primarily, you know, based on my life in the U.S. And uh, I'm about to create more memories for myself. You know, you're part of it. This is a nice talk we, we we've been having. Very, you know, we 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 meet intellectually and I think even emotionally at the same level. That's always a, a good conversation to have. And and memories now is uh, uh, I live in a place where, where where I've never been surrounded by more friendly people than uh, in the suburb south of Austin, Texas. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know say anything bad about all the other states I lived in. I'm just telling you, even the folks that check out your groceries at the supermarket greet you with a smile. That's amazing. And you, what what that does to you, me, I, I, I've become a whole lot more friendly and a whole lot more happy with myself. Okay. So, and I, I have, I'm, I'm, you know, we, I'm here because of a divorce and I just had this morning, a great talk with uh, my, uh, my ex-wife. Uh, I'm going to go visit. She lives with our daughter in Atlanta and we we're good friends. We, we just, we just did didn't know how to make it work. Okay. Uh, anyways, so I, I live in, in an apartment by myself, but I'm not lonely. I have so many good friends uh, that uh, it's it's almost I I can't accommodate any more people that I meet simply because good friendships require care and feeding, and you can't, you can't just accumulate a hundred people. So my limit is about forty, and I'm I'm a, I'm Fundamentally, with some minor exceptions, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a happy camper these days. Taborski, I appreciate your time sharing your stories. So interesting. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.